I am uh, I'm showing you a fuzzy version of the cover of Pedagogy of the Oppressed from the 1986 edition that I'm using. That's probably a much earlier edition than any of you are using, even if you've downloaded it from the internet. Um, but I did want you to know that that's what I'm using. And so when I make page number references, they're going to be to the 1986 edition, which is probably different from yours. Um, my suggestion is that if you want to find the exact page I'm referring to, it's probably somewhere close to the page number I give you, but it won't be exact. So there you go. A couple of things to uh, note about our, our friend uh, Paolo Freire and Pedagogy of the Oppressed is that um, it really represents something called critical pedagogy. Critical pedagogy is an approach that is based on the work of Paolo Freire. And the goal is really, as you can see from my red underlines from before, to teach people to understand the political and economic forces that influence the structure of society in order to prepare them to work for social change. Um, that's actually a, a really important approach to thinking about globalization and educational equity. Because what it does is it helps us to really put an emphasis on power and conflict relations and how that shapes uh, how society is structured and how institutions within societies are structured, institutions like education. It also has an action component. So critical pedagogy is really meant to prepare you, me, whomever is using it, to work for social change. So there always is an assumption that any of the research or, or learning or studying that we're doing about education and political and economic forces and, and et cetera, is in order to prepare us for some sort of social change. So critical pedagogy, based on the work of Paolo Freire, is a problem-solving solving approach uh, and a way to link education to the lives of students. That would be us, right? We are students of, of whatever it is we're studying about global, uh, globalization and educational equity. So the idea is that we're going to pose problems related to educational equity and globalization. And then using those problems, we will link education or understanding about something to the lives of uh, students, which may be ourselves or maybe students we're working with. It really helps us think about the consequences of our own actions and the causes for our own thinking. Now, I want to emphasize that when we say, like when this says uh, consequences of one's actions and one's thinking, a, a dangerous thing is to try to guess or suppose what somebody else is thinking or what somebody else's motivations for doing what they're doing are. And so I just want to say that, that as a, someone who works with people who are much more into critical pedagogy than, than I myself actually am, um, there's a real danger to supposing what other people are thinking and doing and, and assuming that you understand all of the reasons behind that, right? So let's be very careful as we use critical pedagogy not to use it as a blaming or a, a finger pointing tool, but to rather use it as a way to discover our own uh, location in these political and economic forces and our own ways that we can work for social change. Now, Paolo Freire has uh, quite a few different works. Uh, pedagogy of the Oppressed is just one of many. Um, there are lots of other pedagogy of the dot, dot, dot works that he's done. Um, in those other works, including Pedagogy of the Oppressed, of course, he talks about five stages of dialogue. And these are five stages or ways of understanding why we do what we do and why we think what we think. And so uh, let me just point them out because these are really important to critical pedagogy. One is that participants in whatever activity it is, let's say it's this class activity, describe what they see. What is a situation that you see related to education and educational equity? It could be the gender and technology example that I've used in class before. It could be something more specific to what you're doing. I don't care, but you describe what you see. And then the teachers pose problems regarding the codified representation. In other words, the idea is that things that happen have symbolism. So not everything that we see happening is literally for that uh, practical purpose. 
So a teacher standing up in front of a classroom and giving a lesson. We, we can see that and we can say, all right, that is a teacher conveying information. But if we look a little bit beyond that, if we look a little bit at the symbolism of that, what does it mean to have the teacher standing in front of a class? What does that signify about the teacher's power role and the teacher's dominance over the students? What does it signify when students are silent and take notes whenever the teacher talks? What does that suggest about the political and economic forces that are shaping the structure of that classroom and the function of a lesson? The third step from a critical pedagogy point of view is to reflect upon our previous states of silence. Why have we, for example, come to accept this teacher-student uh, relationship as the dominant mode or as the right or best mode for education? Why haven't we noticed the power dominance or the conflict struggles that go on between uh, you know, dominant teachers and subordinate students? Just using that as an example. Next, participants go through increasing levels of critical awareness as they come to understand the ways that political and economic circumstances shaped their lives and thinking. Holy smoke, this <laughs> is really the crux of the matter. So as we read through Pedagogy of the Oppressed, as we talk about the things that we're going to talk about in this class, it's going to be very important for us to recognize um, our own uh, political and economic circumstances that have shaped our lives and thinking and then to be able to have the tools to recognize the political and economic uh, circumstances that shape the lives and the thinking of uh, students and teachers and parents and community leaders in educational systems in different parts of the world. And then finally, this is a very critical pedagogy statement, the controlling influence of the oppressor is ejected from their minds. <laughs> I love the way that's stated, right? So the idea is that all of the dominant ways of thinking that we have been trained through our formal education, our informal education, our non-formal education, all of that has to be ejected and rejected from our, from our minds, right? Even if we recognize that we may, in fact, be the oppressors, we have to eject that controlling influence. So not an easy task we have before us. But this is the critical pedagogy approach that Paolo Freire introduced us to and that as, as critical pedagogy develops and moves forward, these are the kinds of ideas that will continue to be a part of that. And there are a lot of people who work from a critical uh, pedagogy perspective in comparative and international education. So this is a very important approach to recognize. And pedagogy of the oppressed and Paolo Freire's work in general is, is a cornerstone of this critical pedagogy approach and a cornerstone to really replacing some of the dominant understandings and ways of thinking that we have been uh, trained and accustomed to using. I will come back in the next video and talk a little more specifically about Paolo Freire.